a message entitled, Moving Forward by Having Faith in God's Will and in God's Favor. Because that's the only way you can move forward in life. The only way you can move forward in life is by trusting God. If you don't trust God, you won't move. You won't move forward if you don't have faith in God. You will just stand still or you will step back, but you will not move forward into possessing all of the promises that God wants you to possess unless you have faith in God's favor and in His will. What's His favor? His, his favor is His grace. And what is His will? His will is what He wants you to do in life. And so this applies collectively to all of us, but also individually to each one of us as we live our lives with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, five years ago, I told you that the Lord had laid on my heart that we were an Exodus generation type church that needed to become a Deuteronomy generation type church. And, and that probably applies to probably just about every congregation from time to time over their life cycles. After so many uh, decades or whatever of their existence, they need to, to get renewed and refreshed and refocused. It also probably applies to our lives individually as Christians. Every now and then, we, we, we need to, to go from being a, a one type of generation Christian to another type of generation Christian. And remember the Exodus generation, they wanted to, to they were always looking back at the past. And they always wanted to go back. Remember the Exodus generation? They kept saying, Moses, did you lead us out here to die, Moses? We were better off in Egypt. They always wanted to go back to the past. And that's because, and that's why the Exodus generation never possessed the promises that God had for them. It's because they always wanted to go back. And God wasn't calling them to the back. God was calling them forward. Yeah. And so it wasn't until the Exodus generation died off and Israel kind of morphed into becoming the Deuteronomy generation that they started moving forward in life. Why? Because the Deuteronomy generation remembered the mistakes of the past, had decided not to repeat them anymore, and they decided to be a forward-leading, forward-thinking uh, generation of Israel because they, they were thinking forward and they were leaning forward because they understood that life is constantly moving forward. You can't go back to the past. The past was what it was, but the forward is yet what God is calling you to be. And so there really is only one direction you can go with God in life, and that is forward. And it's the Deuteronomy generation of Israel that understood that. That's why the Deuteronomy generation of Israel was the generation that possessed the promises of God because they had renewed and refocused themselves on their godly identity. They, they were trusting and teachable again. They, they were peaceful and purposeful and hopeful and humble and they were hungry and they were enthusiastic and they were forward-thinking and they were forward-leaning type people because they realized you can't go back to the past because life is always going forward. And so as they proceeded forward and they crossed the Jordan River under Joshua's now leadership, Moses led them out of, of Egypt, but it was Joshua who led them into the Promised Land. As they crossed the Jordan River and they stood on the west banks of the Jordan River, they just didn't stop and stand there and stand still. No, what did they do? They continued to progress forward step by step by prayer and by the power of God to possess the promises that God had for them in life and that principle applies to any Christian's life today. Yes. Be it a Christian or a congregation who wants to possess the promises that God has for them in life cannot be content in there, cannot be so complacent as to just stand there and stand still and wait for it to come to happen. They've got to be willing to take steps forward to follow God by faith, by prayer, and in the power of His Spirit to go forward and to possess the promises that God has for them in life. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to face conflicts from time to time in life and challenges from time to time in life. If you look at the Deuteronomy generation under Joshua, they certainly face challenges in life from time to time. They face some external conflicts in life from time to time, but they faced them together and they faced them with the presence of God 
in, in and among their midst and everything, and God led them in victory in himself. But in, at the same time of facing some, some contests and some conflicts from time to time in life, they also continued, listen to this now, to reach out and to connect with people around them. And I'm thinking of the girl named Rahab. They connected with a girl named Rahab. Now, I'm not going to tell you what she did for a living, but it's something no one should want to do for a living. Certainly no dad wants their daughters to do this for a living, and you probably know what I'm speaking of right now. It always occurs to me that, that where you see her in the Bible and it says Rahab the prostitute, it makes me wonder as you go through uh, like Hebrews chapter 6, and it says, you know, in Hebrews 6 and back in, in Joshua 1, it says, or Joshua 2, it says, and Rahab, the prostitute, Rahab. I wonder if it goes through all of eternity where Rahab is just saying, well, you can just call me Rahab, though. <laughs> That's okay. You see, she was a girl from the wrong side of the tracks, but she, she had this reverence for God. And she was incredibly helpful to the apostle, or to, to, to uh, Joshua's people, to Israel, as they moved forward. By faith in God. Remember, she's the one that hid them from the spies, or hid the spies from the other people as they crossed the Jordan and as they were getting into Jericho. So as Israel moved forward and they were facing some conflicts from time to time, they also were connecting with people from time to time. And it occurs to me that we are very much like that today. That we collectively, and I hope individually, are a, are a Deuteronomy generation type of a church. That we are moving forward step by step with God, having faith in his favor and in his will, to progressively possess the promises that God has for us in life. And we will face and have faced and, and are facing and will continue from time to time to face different conflicts and contests and things like that outside of, of, of the church. But we will hopefully be people who are and who continue to connect with people from all sides of the tracks, from everywhere that we see, connecting with people around us while we are moving forward progressively to possess the promises of God. Why? Because the people around us are part of possessing the promises of God in our lives. Amen. You see, part of the will that God has for us is that we would not be an island unto ourselves, just like no Christian is an island unto themselves, but that we would be pressing forward and reaching out to connect with people around us. That's part of possessing the promises of God are the people that we connect with in life. And the same advice and counsel that Moses gave Joshua, I feel God is giving us today. Where it says in Joshua chapter 1, get ready. Amen. Get ready to enter into the promises of God. To be strong and be courageous and to be careful not to depart from the word of God, but to do everything written in it. Look at that. And you will be successful. If you will be strong, if you will be courageous, if you will be careful to not depart from the word of God, but then to live the word of God, God promises you will be successful in everything you do because the Lord your God is with you. And church, that promise of God's word applies to each one of us individually. If you individually, when you're in your relationship with God, if you will be strong and be courageous. You know, it takes some courage to be a Christian. Don't let anybody, anybody fool you uh, or, or tell you any different than that. It takes some courage to be a Christian today. Amen. Just look at the Christians who are being martyred and killed on the other side of the world rather than recant their relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. It takes some courage to be a Christian today in the world that we live, at home, at work, in school, in our communities, and in our countries. But if we'll be strong, if we'll be courageous, if we'll be careful to do what the Word of God says in our lives, then God promises that you will be successful in life because the Lord your God will be with you. It doesn't mean you won't run into some bumps and bruises along the way. But it does mean that, thanks be to God, he will always lead us in victory Amen. in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen? And part of moving forward with God 
also includes making plans by prayer and by pragmatics. What do I mean by that? Well, you can't move forward in life individually or collectively unless you start making plans. You've got to start making them. And I think as Christians, we ought to make all our plans by prayer. Lord, what do you want us to do? Because we want to keep in step with your spirit. We want to live out your will in our lives. And also, I'm a pragmatist. I think you need to look at life pragmatically. As you say, Lord, what is your will for our lives? What is your plan? What do you want us to do? I believe God gave us a head on our shoulders, and we ought to look around in our lives pragmatically and say, pragmatically, Lord, what do we need to do in order to continue to move forward with you in prayer? In Proverbs, uh, by prayer, Proverbs 16, verse 3, it says, Commit your work to the Lord so your plans may be successful. In Proverbs 16, verse 9, it says, A man makes plans in his heart, but God guides and directs his steps. Psalm 37, verse 23, that says, The steps of the righteous, they are directed by God, because God delights in the details of their life. Stop for a moment and just reappreciate how well God knows you. How deeply he loves you. How intimately he's guiding and directing your steps in life. Think for a moment, how did you get here to this point in your life today? Do you think it was totally by yourself? By the decisions you make? By the directions you chose to take? No. I believe God guided and directed you. Amen. I believe God is like our loving <coughs> Heavenly Father in heaven who guides and directs the steps of his toddling children along the way in life. And see, until a toddler learns how to find their balance, they need someone Amen. to guide and direct their steps, to make sure they don't fall too far to the right or too far to the left, to make sure they don't fall, to make sure they don't hit their heads on the, on the wall or on something. I believe our lovingly Heavenly Father is just like that. I believe He comes up alongside of us for the duration of our lives, because I believe it takes a lifetime to really find your balance in life. And He comes up and He guides and directs our steps as we're His children, just toddling along in life. And he says, okay, now go this way. Okay, now go this way. And why is God guiding and directing our steps? Because He's got a plan for us, church. He's got a purpose for us. He's got a will and He wants to he wants us to find out the way to do his will in our lives. And so what does he do? He guides and directs our steps. Do you think about where you are at now in life compared to where you were decades ago? Do you really think it's only because of the decisions you made and the paths you chose to take? Do you really not think that it is not God living out the scripture in your life, that he has guided and directed your steps, that they are ordered of God because he so loves you he so delights in every detail of your life. Our, our loving Heavenly Father is a, is a wonderful, loving Heavenly Father. Now listen, Amen. because we know this about God, because God knows us intimately, and He cares for us deeply, it ought to make following Him by faith just a little bit more fun, shouldn't it? Amen. I mean, following God by faith should be fun when you trust that He's taking care of you when you trust that he's guiding and directing your steps. I mean, so many times we wind ourselves up like a spring, don't we? We get all wound up inside, trying to strive to, to know God's will and to do God's will. Oh, I just got to know God's will. We get all hot and bothered by wound up so tight within us. Got to know God's will. Got to know God's will. Got to do, how do I do God's will? How do I know God's will? How do I do God's will? We get so wound up like a spring. My heavens, eventually that spring's going to break, isn't it? If you don't unwind that spring from time to time, keep wiping up tighter and tighter and tighter, eventually that thing's just going to pop, isn't it? Well, see, a person who really trusts Psalms 37, 23 to be active and alive in their life, God guides and directs their steps, that's the kind of Christian that ought to be able to relax a little bit more in life. That ought to be able to unwind that spring. Because they trust that God is going to lead, guide, and direct them in his will. Another part of moving forward with God, speaking of God's will, is trusting God's will. You can't move forward in life unless you trust the will of God in your life. And there's no greater evidence of having faith in God than to trust the will of God in your life. But sometimes 
there's a struggle in there, isn't it? Sometimes there's a contention between our will and God's will. I mean, after all, we know what we want in life. We want what we want. But we also know, the Bible tells us, that God has a will for our lives. That means God wants what he wants in our lives. And when two wills collide, what will's got to give? And the only way that anybody can make God's will their will is to surrender their will to God's will. To say, God, I want to live my life your way. The only way to live a life of faith is by trusting and surrendering to God's will. And we've got a great example of, of someone who did that for us. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, two wills collided. His human will and his divine will. His human will, understandably, did not want to go to the cross. His human will did not want those spikes going through his wrists and through his feet. His human will did not want to be flogged beyond belief and beyond human recognition. His human will did not want to bleed profusely and die of suffocation on the cross in a most agonizing form of death. His human will did not want to bear the sins of the world, and that is something you and I cannot even begin to comprehend what that would be like. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, when two wills collided, he gave us yet again another example of how to be a Christian when he surrendered to his divine will, to his heavenly Father's will, when he said, Father, if you can let this cup pass before me, I would really appreciate it, but if not, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. You know, some people, they, they start to make plans, as you should. You can't move forward unless you do make plans. But sometimes plans can become presumptive. We get presumptuous in our plans. And we get presumptuous with what we think the will of God is in our lives. Now, this, admittedly, this is where it's going to sound like there's a monkey wrench coming into the message here, and there really isn't. I'm just trying to, to preach a balanced uh, message according to scriptures as we follow the theme. You see, sometimes as, as we're making plans for the future to follow God by faith, and, and, and we, we, we presumptively say, this is what God's will is for our lives, and this is what's going to happen in the future. And sometimes we get all kind of frankly uppity. Not arrogant necessarily, although sometimes it could be arrogance, but just we get resolved in our conviction. We know this is what, you know, the if this was a wood pulpit, that would sound so much better. We know what is going to happen. You know, this thing doesn't resonate at all. But we know, and we pound our fist on the pulpit, and we say, this is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to do. It's definitely going to work, and we're going to go that way, and that is God's will for our lives. But sometimes it doesn't always work out so well. And I think it's because of James chapter 4. I think it's because of godly wisdom that comes from James 4, verses 13 to 15, that I've tried to live my life after. Once I learned it, I thought, wow, this is another thing that God really wants me to, to live in my life. And that is not to be indecisive, but to be teachable and leadable. It says in James 4, 13 to, to 15, the Holy Spirit says, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And you don't. None of us do. We could get hit by a car and die today. Something horrible could happen that we were totally unforeseen. That could throw a monkey wrench into our plans. James chapter 4, verses 13 to 15 says, You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You say you're going to get up and go here or go there and do this or do that and, and be successful. But you don't know what will happen tomorrow. So James 4.15 says, So what you ought to say is, If it is the Lord's will, we will live and we will go here or go there or do this or do that. So church, while I am absolutely sure, certain of this, that God has a plan and a purpose for us to be successful. He's got a plan and a purpose for us to prosper in his kingdom. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. But I don't know all the details of what the future holds. Amen. Even though I know who holds the future. Amen. So what I will say to you is this. While I believe God has a plan and a purpose for us, and he's got a future for us to be prosperous, I will say it the way I am reading from Scripture. If it is the Lord's will. But all of this is predicated on if it is the Lord's will. 
because I don't know all the details that are coming, uh, coming down the road. I don't know all the details of what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future. And it is God, and he's got a plan, and he's got a purpose to prosper us. Now, part of making plans and moving forward to the future, Habakkuk said, was to have a vision. And that the vision needed to be plain, simple, clear. And it needed to be something people could aim for, something they could aspire to, and something they could actually achieve. Now, I don't know... Like I said, I don't know everything that tomorrow holds. I was surprised in 2011. I was surprised with some information I found out a couple of weeks ago that I'll fill you in on more tonight. I don't know what all the details of tomorrow holds. But I do know two things. I do know God holds our future, and God loves us, and he's taking care of us, and he's walking us into his will and through his will right now. And I also know that we have a vision. And I know we've had a vision at least since I got here in September of 2010. And the vision was plain, simple, clear. We wrote it down, and we've been preaching, teaching, nagging, and talking about it ad nauseum for the last almost five years now. And that is, we exist to connect people to God and to each other through faith in Jesus Christ. Whether we live here at Brookfield, or we live in Menominee Falls, or we were to go to New Berlin, or Oconomowoc, or Pewaukee, or wherever it was that we would exist, we exist. You exist as a Christian. I exist as a Christian. We exist as a congregation to connect people to God and to each other, specifically and solely through faith in Jesus Christ at home, at work in our communities, in our, uh, congreg in our congregations, in our schools, and in our country. That's our mission, that's our model, and that is our mandate that we have from God. Because it fits the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. To love God and love our neighbors as ourselves, and to go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we're not doing this, if we're not doing our mission, our motto, and our mandate, then all we're talking about is building buildings. And the church has never been about building buildings. That is always an afterthought. That's always a secondary thing. The church has always been about what? Building the kingdom of God. Amen. One person at a time. By connecting people to God and to each other through faith in Jesus Christ. It might seem like a little thing, but it's a foundational thing. It's a fundamental thing which means you can't do a bigger thing than connecting people to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to me, church. Islamic terrorists have done a really good job showing the world that Satan has come to kill, steal, and destroy life. The church needs to start getting loud and proud and doing a better job at telling the world that Jesus has come to give life and life more abundantly. And while we might not be able to do that in Afghanistan and in Iraq, we can certainly do that here in Brookfield. We can do it in New Berlin. We can do it in Menominee Falls. We can do it in Oconomowoc in Heartland. We can do it in Dowsman. We can do it in Pewaukee. We can do it wherever our feet are planted, church. We just need to be doing it. Amen?